Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll talk about the role of community foundations in strengthening American cities with guests, Will Ginsburg, President and CEO of the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven, and Mike Parks, President of the Dayton Foundation. A reminder to Zoom attendees that we will take three snap polls during the show and we'll announce results and questions submitted through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. Thank you both for joining. It, I'm so excited about this discussion because your organizations basically form some of the connective tissue in your communities and you address issues as they arise um, uh, and sometimes totally unexpectedly and sometimes you can see uh, the issues coming from, from quite a distance. Uh, Mike, before we started, we were talking about the biblical uh, issues that we're all confronting. We not only have a pandemic, um, a, a economic crisis, but you and Dayton have confronted some really serious, serious issues. Uh, could you just sort of give us the lay of the land of how you're doing and, and, and what you've experienced um, o over the last uh, uh, year? It's been a real test of resilience for our community over the last year. Uh, last Memorial Day, early in the morning, 15 tornadoes ripped through Dayton and um, hit disproportionately our poorest neighborhoods. And um, obviously a great response from our nonprofit sector, our city, our county. And uh, just as that individual recovery was underway on August 4th, again, early in the morning, a uh, mass shooting occurred in a, the Oregon district in Dayton, which is a social district. Uh, where nine lives were taken and another 30 plus were injured. And uh, that uh, went on through the fall along with the tornado recovery only to be followed by COVID and now the challenge we have around race and equity. So it's been a real test of resiliency and uh, particularly for philanthropy. Uh, we'll talk more about it, but just how uh, philanthropists have stepped up to help in three very different ways. Uh, the recovery of our community has really been uh, uh, astounding and we've been very, uh, very uh, appreciative of the support that uh, how people have stepped up, Mark. And, and the thing that is so important is that people develop community foundations, they participate in community foundations, they give to community foundations because they have the long view of, of how Dayton, how New Haven, how other communities could develop to become stronger places to live, more enjoyable places to live. And then these, these issues sort of tumble upon us and all of a sudden we have to adjust, we have to shift almost instantaneously. I know you will have been um, uh, encountering uh, some of that issue yourself. Um, could you talk a little bit about what's going on in New Haven, totally different part of the country, but you're encountering some of the same issues. Well, we are Mark and thank you. It's nice to see you again and my friend Mike, it's nice to see you always. Um, yes, and, and what you just said, Mark, of course, is right about community foundations, that, uh, that these are perpetual institutions that, uh, that whose value add is that they know the community uh, and, and have the long view. But the value add is also that, that community foundations can, uh, can pivot and reflect what's going on in the community at any given time. It's why things like variance power were built into the, into the creation of these community foundations from the beginning. So, so, uh, so we need to be prepared uh, to respond to what's happening. And what's happening right now in our community, as in uh, we haven't had quite the, uh, the, uh, uh, the onslaught of, of problems that uh, Mike just articulated in Dayton, but this is an extraordinary time in our community as it is in our country. And COVID uh, specifically has uh, has um, demonstrated, uh, you know, has impacted the community so deeply and so broadly, economically, socially, health-wise. Uh, it's all different now. I mean, it's the only way I can summarize it. Everything is different now. And COVID, again, here, like, like across the country, has, uh, the, the impact has been so disproportionate on uh, people of color, on people of modest means, uh, people who were, who were already outside the economic and social mainstream in one way or another. Um, so, so COVID has really bared the inequities in our society and in our community 
in ways, things we all knew, and people like us who've been working on these issues our whole lives, of course, know, but, but, but the society is confronting those in a way now that is very different uh, than in the past, in my experience. Uh, so I think this is both a, a moment of desperate, terrible need. It's also a moment of opportunity for change. Uh, I think this is a moment when people see the need for change in a way that perhaps not before. One of the things that, that, that I think is, is so interesting is that if you take a look, Will, it, and, and you do a great job of honoring your founders, the people who came before, the people who had the first impetus, uh, and it would be great to, to have you tell the story a little bit about that. But one of the things that's interesting, when you look at, at these different community foundations, very often they're founded by business leaders, uh, civic leaders, um, at the heart of, of these uh, cities that in our history were divided along lines of race and income. Absolutely. And, and now we are, and the, the pandemic and um, the, ver the violence and uh, the economic dislocation is laying bare in, a in such a clear way uh, those disparities and the issues that, that we're confronting today. So you have to change uh, your foundation. You have to you have to think about how do you evolve while still honoring the great past that you have, but make but build a different future. Mike, when you're when you're looking at this um, issue and and how you adjust to the various challenges that are just confronting you out of nowhere, how are you uh, uh, evolving your group so that you have representation on your board? You have uh, a, a back and forth with your grantees that does not feel like a, a neo-colonialist top-down approach that is really one of dialogue. How are, you, how are you dealing with that? Well, the dealing particularly with issues of race and equity, uh, because it, at, its, at its core, as Will mentioned, community foundations, um, this is not new work for us. But yet, I think if you collectively said community foundations across America, I think we all say we have to do more. It doesn't, whatever we've done is noble, it's good, it's matter, it's important, but it's just not enough. And um, the, the, the disparities that, to, your, to use your word, Mark, that have been laid open, it's, it's disgusting, right? And we've got to do more. And I, when you look around the country, that's what's happening. You know, Will in New Haven and Seattle and Chicago and Dayton, everybody, people are saying, how do I lean in more? And uh, we represent the community. We are the community. And that's our role. It's our responsibility. It's why we're built to do what we're, we're here to do. Will, how are you confronting this? Are you changing who you hire? Are you changing how you interact with, with, uh, with your community? And of course, you're in the home of Yale. And Yale itself has had its own very fraught history. And they're trying to come to terms with that. Uh the short answer to that question uh, is yes. Uh, we are rethinking our processes, we're rethinking our strategies. Uh, and go back to a point you made earlier, Mark, uh, in terms of the history and the legacy that created this institution, our institution over 92 years. We're thinking about that in new ways too. I mean, honoring the donors and the intent of the donors is at the core of what we do and have always done. And the model of taking, uh, being a perpetual institution and and, and uh, only taking a spending, uh, a spending distribution off the endowment that enables us to be perpetual is at the core of what we've been for over nine decades. And yet we feel that 2020 and looking forward is, is a truly unique time. So for the first time in the, in the almost 100 year history of this institution, we're thinking of going uh, uh, deep. We're in, in dialogue with our board, right? I'm in dialogue with the board right now and the board's very enthusiastic about going deep into, uh, into the endowment and doing an extraordinary extraction of resources and making a significant increase over the next three years uh, in our discretionary spending so that we can, uh, we can reach these issues, issues of how we create opportunity, issues of how we uh, ameliorate the impacts of COVID and issues of how we promote racial equity uh, uh, that uh, we can, we can uh, really accelerate uh, our impact in those areas because the times demand it. So it's, we are really rethinking all the, not only our current strategies, but all the guiding principles that have created this institution over time. 
I want to emphasize the extraordinary statement that, that you made, because when we met, Will, one of the first things that you said is that we have a culture of, of always focused, on, of being focused on sustainability and never breaking that wall of sustainability. And what you're saying is the need of the moment, the need for a transformation of the moment means that we have to break an aspect of our culture to create a new culture that is scaled to our future as opposed to our past. And that's, that's a very, very big move for any community foundation to make. We just took a poll and it's, it's interesting. I wanna ask you a question that emerges from this. We asked um, respondents to talk about whether they would uh, prefer to uh, donate directly to the nonprofit of their choice or route their donations through, the, through a community foundation. And it's interesting that 77% uh, say directly to a nonprofit. And that's enabled very much by the fact that we're all connected through uh, these little devices uh, here. Um, how do you ensure that you are providing value add to your donors, to people who want to become civically engaged uh, what kind of services do you provide, Mike, um, to donors who have a lot of different routes to, to move their funds and their support to different causes, including at the grocery store, right? I mean, we, we check out of Whole Foods and the, the last thing people ask is, do you want to donate? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, the response to that poll, 77%, I think it's outstanding. I think, I think uh, Will would be in my camp that anytime yep. anybody wants to give to charity, I don't think we care how it gets there is is make it happen and so i think that's all good and all the different forms of giving is all good and community foundations are just one of those forms right and i think what's perhaps a little different is sometimes community foundations deal with um, typical giving scholarship funds or a designated fund for something i care about um, you know my church or my synagogue or my temple whatever that may be but also community foundations we have an aspect and a side to us to deal with some of our most complex and vexing problems that we can't solve individually. Right. It takes the collective good. And I think that's really the value add largely of community foundations, those persistent, stubborn, um, difficult, complex problems. Community foundations are blessed to really be in a unique position, a, a gift really, to play a, an to play a convening role and the opportunity to bring people together to work on that. It's always been part of our history. And particularly, I think when you look at uh, COVID and uh, you know there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of relief funds set up by community foundations across America in, in the last few months. If you look in Dayton, you know the, we, the tornado relief and uh, the mass shooting relief and those are just examples of what community foundations across America are doing each and every day where the collective good uh, happens uh, through a community foundation and something that somebody can't do individually and I think that's really the value add. Do you find, Will, that the people who are giving uh, bring their own expertise to the table and contribute that in a way that affects uh, how these organizations operate and how uh, funds are rooted and used? I absolutely do. And I think that's exactly right. And it goes also to what Mike said. I think, you know, the value add of institutions like ours are uh, what we know about the community from, from the perspective, as you were just saying, Mark. Um, and our ability to connect donors with other. So I think, uh, you know, and perpetuity. I mean, those are the three things that we can offer a donor. So, you know, I think that some people wanna be on the front lines uh, and, uh, and, and we have known, you know, people in our, in our field, people who've had jobs like mine and Mike's who, who itch to get back on the front line, who come to a community foundation from a frontline nonprofit and itch to get back there. Um, some people want, you know, want to be able to take that bigger view, want to be able to take that ecosystem view, want to be able to look at the community as a whole and have agglomerated resources and figure out how we can impact on the bigger issues. So, you know, it's, uh, that's what community foundations have always done. It's what we can do. And it's why we're positioned to respond when extraordinary moments happen like is happening right now. I find the people who are most effective in community foundations or in family foundations are people who have a real passion for either the community. I mean, they're, they're almost wonkily, obsessively focused on either their giving area or, or their community. 
as opposed to having any interest in necessarily holding that particular job, right? They, they're holding the job in order to create the impact as opposed to um, trying to just hold on to the job, you know? Do you find Well, that I always say, problem? to that point, I always say that, you know, community foundation, right? It's about the community and it's about the institution, the foundation. I always say these jobs, at least in my way of thinking, are 80% community and 20% foundation, you know, and, and it's what people who have jobs like mine and Mike's need to be out in the community and need to understand the community. And that's where that's our role, really, and then communicate that to other people. Um, and uh, these are fantastic institutions and fantastic jobs. But I always say, I wouldn't want to have this job in any other community, because it's about this community. It's about this place, this place that I love, this place that I've been working in and committed to for the last 35 years. Mike, where did you grow up and how did you get to where, where you are? I mean, you didn't go to college to be a community foundation leader, right? Yeah, I don't think that was an option uh, on, the, on the selection list. No. Yeah, I, uh, I spent 20 some years with the YMCA in multiple communities, including here in Dayton. And uh, like so many, uh, what's really more important is the knowledge, as Will said, of the community. So I had served as the executive director of our, of our uh, Metropolitan Y for a number of years and and uh, that's really how I got exposed to and engaged with the Community Foundation. As Will said, we're really blessed uh, to be in a position to uh, have the impact that we do. And, and Will, how did you, uh, how, how was your trajectory to uh, arrive at this point? Well, it's a, it's, you know, I've done a whole, I'm a lawyer by training. I haven't been a lawyer for 35 years. I served, came to New Haven in the mid 80s to be a local government official. I ran a nonprofit economic development project in New Haven. I served, then I went to Washington and served in the Clinton administration uh, in the Commerce Department uh, doing economic development work and as chief of staff and then came back 20 years ago to New Haven and to this position. So I've been sort of all over the place, uh, but the thread that connects that to me is community. It's, right. you know, so I did work in community economic development and community philanthropy and uh, some work in community banking. It's, it's about community uh, and, uh, it's and it and I think community is an underappreciated uh, uh, value in American life, where everything has gotten big and the economy. You know, the companies are national, and the kind of companies that built New Haven and built the Community Foundation here aren't local anymore. Uh, we need people who stand up for the idea of local community, and community foundations have that charge. I think, and I think that what you have in common is that whole idea of being broad and uh, being itinerant. You know, uh, we in America tend to focus very, very narrowly and very deeply in, in certain things. That's how we build careers. But if you're going to lead a community foundation, you really have to have a, a very broad uh, purview because ch needs change. Communities need to have input. And if you don't um, connect, if you're not personally connected, either through your experience at the Y, Mike, or will your experience in, in trying to serve others through uh, government service and other types of service, um, it's very difficult to lead an organization whose very mission is to serve everyone, is, is to figure out how you take limited resources and invest them wisely to benefit the entire community. One of the things that we just completed in our poll was very interesting. We asked what is the main concern of funders as they consider their philanthropic strategies. And we only allowed people to answer one, and, and we got um, uh, quite a few uh, people, uh, basically 76% felt that it was either the cause and the mission of the organization and who is impacted. In other words, the target of, of where that impact fell. The third uh, choice was hard metrics and results, which is very interesting. That was about 17% of respondents. Now there was a trend for a while that everything about philanthropy had to be measurable had to be hard metrics. Could you each comment about your view about metrics, hard and soft, and how you, you feed back to your donors how effective you are and, 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 and whether the hard metrics is really the be all and end all. Mike, why don't you start? Well, of course, uh, accountability. When I when you think of metrics, I think of accountability, right? And so it's not our money, right? I mean, we'll be the first to, Community Foundation, it's not my money. It's, you know, the 4,000 uh, folks that have set up funds at the foundation. So it's their money and it's 
it's I'm really a steward and I'm a servant to that money. So um, are my accountable? Of course you have to be accountable and results. And uh, I don't think anybody would um, in any way argue that. With that said, sometimes that gets silly, you know, and I, I think about the last year when you have a, let's take the mass shooting in Dayton where the nine, nine lives were taken and 30 were injured. There were over 4,000 gifts to that fund totaling well over $4 million from all around the world. About half that money came from Greater Dayton, about half came from around the world. Are people looking for accountability? I mean, that's, that's just a silly uh, concept. They're looking to help and show compassion and care. And something I did never realize, you know, that fund was set up the morning of the shooting and was distributed by Thanksgiving um, to those individuals. And it was a were the resources helpful to those families? Of course it was, right? And many of them have just unbelievable pain, suffering, um, dislocation. It, it was unbelievably helpful. But that wasn't the most important part of the fund. The fund was really allowing people to grieve. And the act of giving was part of that grieving and healing process for Dayton, and not just Dayton, really for the country. And so, you know, is metrics important there? I don't think so. It's the act of showing compassion and care for your neighbor. And Booker Washington talked about the fact that you measure a person by the distance that they travel. Too often metrics, it, it basically advantages people who are best positioned to show the numbers side of impact. Whereas very often our, our issues in our society are more complicated than that. How do you, how do you measure quality? right? Uh, a, a lot of this has to do with human interactions, which are not just a bunch of numbers. We can't just be, um, be uh, distilled down into uh, a couple of figures, can we, Will? No, I, I totally agree. And, and uh, you know, I, I would say this in, uh, about metrics, you know, yes, I totally, Mike's, of course, right. Accountability is very important. Metrics are one way to measure, uh, are the way to measure accountability. But, uh, they're inherently limited. And you're quite right, Mark. When I joined this field 20 years ago, I don't think it's an overstatement to say the field was obsessed with this. Uh, I think that obsession has passed, which is a good thing. Um, and one of the things we talk about now when we get together, the larger community foundations, Mike and I are both privileged to be part of that group. Uh, we talk much less about measures and metrics and much more about leadership and change in our communities. Because if, if we're doing our jobs well and we're making the right kind of investments and we're bringing people together in the right ways, yes, uh, you can measure how much we put out. You can measure the impact through a particular nonprofit. But the, but the impact is much broader than that. The, issue, the impact, uh, an act of leadership at the local level has ripple effects that ripple throughout the community that really can't be measured uh, in any meaningful way and don't have to be. So... I'm happy to, you know, I think that, I think met, there was a period in which the, the focus on metrics was uh, significantly uh, overstated. And I think the field has moved away from that. Um, and while accountability remains obviously important and we're not gonna get people to support our work and our institutions if, we are, if we're not producing results and being accountable, I think people recognize that the role of community foundations in many respects can't be measured. I think you and I uh, will really like how Mike um, uh, shaped that question into an accountability uh, question, right? Because accountability takes it away from just numbers. It really is about impact. And then you have to start thinking about what is the best way that you can, one, see the impact and then hold people accountable. Um, we just finished a, uh, a poll, which was really interesting because it, it ties into some of what you both were saying. We asked where the, um, what services are needed most by communities, and we listed arts, media, and culture, children and family, education, health, justice and poverty. Where, where should the investments be? And we basically got a, a pretty even distribution throughout. The one area where the, nobody responded as it being the biggest need was arts, was the arts and culture. So let's talk about the arts and culture because it was very interesting that nobody responded given the situation that we are facing on the economic front and the pandemic front, 
the tornadoes and so on, which are very, very basic. That's understandable. But I'd like, I'd like you each to discuss very briefly and in closing, we're going to, uh, since we started with, uh, with uh, um, uh, Will, uh, we're going to end with, with Mike. So Will, why don't you comment on, on arts and also how the arts and the other needs basically uh, fit with each other in your uh, situation in New Haven? It's an important question. Um, our community foundation has long been a major supporter of the arts in our community. This is a community that prides itself on being a very, uh, a community uh, that, that takes great pride in, in our cultural uh, attributes, in our theaters and museums and at every level, not just uh, you know, uh, at Yale University, but, but uh, in the neighborhoods um, and a very, a very, uh, and, and New Haven's become a magnet for, for the arts and artists. Um, so this is a very important part of how the community identifies itself, and it's an important part of philanthropy. We've also seen over time uh, a, a big, uh, a, a strong correlation between the community foundation's donor base and the donor base of the major arts institutions in our community, and we're mindful of that too. So uh, we have been and remain very important, uh, arts remains a very important part of our portfolio. Balancing it off against basic human needs is always a challenge. And uh, you have to appreciate, uh, and I think too often the impact of the arts is measured in economic terms. The impact of the arts is measured, it, we, we support the arts because of the intrinsic value of the arts and what it contributes to the community. And the last thing I'll say about this, Mark, is as we think about how we deal with the issues of racial inequity and how we deal with bringing our community back together again at this very perilous time. The arts is very important because uh, it is a way to create bridges and common understanding among people in the community and our arts institutions do that and in many cases do it brilliantly and we want to support that. And Mike, how do you, how do you see this? Because part of the, the, the challenge that we face in, uh, in diversity and inclusion and empowerment is that uh, arts organizations do map to our own history. And sometimes those organizations have not been as embracing of, of the leadership of diverse communities, of communities of color, of women, um, as, as we today uh, know they must be. How, how are you seeing the arts in your community when you measure against some of these other needs that you were describing? Yeah, it's, um, I'm not fooling anybody that's listening, right? It's an unbelievably difficult challenge, right? You got somebody that doesn't have a house because they got hit by a tornado and you got, how are we gonna fund a new opera, right? I mean, we all get that. It's what an unbelievably difficult. With that said, uh, what I can say is, is the response from, from donors and how deep, not just here in Dayton, but all across the country, but particularly here in Dayton, as we think about what we've gone through in the last year, how people have just done again and again and again, including funding the arts, um, has been just uh, outstanding. And it's just the, the, the level of philanthropy and giving and caring is phenomenal. It's tough. We all understand the, the, the importance and the food chain and you know all that, we get that, but we can't let the arts go. They're a critical part of our lives, they're a critical part of our communities, they're a pretty critical part of the souls of our communities. And uh, luckily we have a number of donors who continue to step up and help. And is it gonna be a tough time? Of course, it's gonna be a really tough time for the arts, but uh, together we'll make a difference. We can do it. I think that we can be instructed by the, the traumas that we have as a, a species uh, lived through over the last hundred years and how the arts have always been with us as a way to uh, bind us together, to create understanding and to create an island of joy sometimes within uh, really, really difficult times. And so um, thinking about the, the work in education, the work um, of, of sustenance, the work of health, and then incorporating uh, some joy is, is so important. I wanna thank you both for contributing your insights into your communities, of sharing the great work that you, your donors, your grantees are doing to strengthen New Haven and Dayton. Um, that's the nonprofit report. Attendees, thank you so much for your questions. And, uh, and for your interest, please attend again uh, next week on Tuesday and of course on Thursday. And, and thank you all for, uh, for a strengthening American civil society. Mm -hmm.